thank you for the invitation to speak to you all today. Um, I'm going to talk about NMR hardware. Oh, I, I should say, because uh, um, there's some issue as to where I am or where I was. I was a professor for 29 years at Washington U in St. Louis. And uh, I've been here at ABQMR, Albuquerque Magres, for oh, about six years now. And uh, so while I retired from the university, I'm not retired. I come to work every day. Um, anyway, uh, uh, we're a small contract research house. Uh, we do both the measurements and specialty equipment to the government, to industry. And like, for example, our current big project is in connection with Texas Agriculture and Texas A&M University, where we're looking at MRI of sorghum plant roots in the ground and in the greenhouse. Um, NMR hardware is a, a different subject than usually these, these seminars uh, discuss, but I always thought one of the beauties of NMR was that it ex you had to understand it on so many different levels. There's the spin Hamiltonian level, the pulse sequence engineering level, uh, there's a level of understanding your particular chemical, biological, material system and analyzing the data that comes out. And then, of course, there's the NMR hardware level, all the electronics that goes into making it do exactly what you want the spins to do. So um, uh, please understand that I have in mind a certain target audience. And I'll bet nobody fits. Nobody fits exactly what I have in mind. But I was told that a lot of the people in this uh, audience are solid state NMR types. Uh, I'm thinking of people who are early career, not, not even yet mid career. Uh, maybe you work in a research group that uh, is a, uh, got technically knowledgeable people to take care of the hardware. So when anything goes wrong, they sort of push you aside and say, no, no, I will take care of it because it's their job. And also because if you screw it up, you're not just ruining your next trip or your next date on the spectrometer, but the time of the next six people in line who are sharing the same spectrometer. Well, if that's you, well, that's who I have in mind. And, and, and maybe you're thinking uh, this multi-user uh, facility with uh, technically knowledgeable people around is great, because uh, my professor is a bigwig and is well-funded, but what am I gonna do when I'm my own assistant professor? I'm not gonna have that kind of funding to afford that kind of uh, not technically knowledgeable people. And, and maybe, and I hope, you're also just curious, how does it all work? And so uh, let's get started. Um, there was something in, in the publicity on this that said building your own spectrometer or something. No, most of us will never build our own spectrometer, uh, but you'll sure need to debug it. Even though it's terribly reliable stuff, you'll still need to debug it uh, when there is uh, NMR, no more resonance signal. And so um, we're going to talk about the diagnosis of the spectrometer, the probe, and that'll necessarily take us into test equipment oscilloscopes, signal generators, vector network analyzers. And then I'm going to devote some time to uh, what you would have to do to build a simple probe. Uh, I think it's terribly educational. And um, it's the one part of the spectrometer that you don't need to solder uh, chips with 96 leads to printed circuit boards and so on. You can do this and you can make a custom probe. OK. so. Um, Here's a simple spectrometer, at least in principle. And nowadays, a lot of these functions are taken care of in digital uh, um, uh, electronics. But here's the basic idea. There's a synthesizer or frequency source somewhere. There's a gate, and it also establishes the phase and amplitude. It gets amplified up to the milliwatt level where there's typically a commercial power amplifier putting out between 100 watts and a kilowatt. It goes to a transmit receive switch. The name goes all the way back to the, the early days in the second war of radar. Uh, 
transmit receive switch and is directed to the probe to flip the spins, excite the spins, comes back, goes through the, the receive channel here where there's a preamplifier, typically 30 dBs of gain. And then it goes into the spectrometer itself where there's an amplifier and some kind of phase detector. And again, typically the phase detector today is accomplished in digital, but there's a reference signal here for the phase detection. The two outputs I and Q uh, get, um, get um, um, digitized and put into the computer and the computer also runs the uh, uh, pulse sequence generator to control the gates. All right. And so uh, if something goes wrong, your first question is, what is it? Transmitter, receiver, probe? What do I do? Well, um, if it doesn't pulse and doesn't run, but just sits there like a lump of cold spaghetti, uh, you should suspect the computer control is wrong. And uh, I can provide you no guidance on that. You might check that the magnet is on. It almost always is, but you never know, could have quenched. And so um, if you have a wrench and you hold it in two hands, two hands, so it doesn't get away from you, you can make sure that when you're three feet away or something like that, there's a torque and, and a small force on it. So you're sure that the magnet has still got current. All right. So then we'll look at the transmitter output. So if you take the output of the spectrometer pulsing away, you would run it through some attenuators into an oscilloscope to look for the RF pulses. And um, you dare not, you better not run the spectrometer with its 100 watts or 1,000 watts right into the oscilloscope because you'll destroy the scope. OK, so the, um, there's a total of 60 dBs of attenuation, maybe. And that turns a kilowatt into a milliwatt. And that's you know a half a volt peak to peak or something like that on the oscilloscope. And you'll be able to see it just fine. Um, uh, the first attenuator has to be capable of handling high power pulses. And even though pulsed NMR uses low duty cycle, it's on very little, a tenth of a percent, uh, the input attenuator has to be able to handle the peak power. And uh, we'll come back to that. And, um, and after you've checked the transmitter that way, you could replace the oscilloscope over here with an RF signal generator and inject a milliwatt of signal. And by the time it gets done over here, uh, going back through 60 dBs, it'll be a nanowatt. That turns out to be a big signal. And you should be able to see it on your spectrometer. Well, let's look at that in detail. When you're looking at the high power uh, transmitter, uh, the usual attenuators are, are rated for a watt or half a watt and you can buy them 20, 30, 40 dBs of attenuation. They're just fine. But the first attenuator, the first one in the line, this one right here, needs to be able to look directly at the kilowatt pulse from the uh, amplifier. And uh, you might want to uh, buy a high power attenuator. But if you're, like I said, an assistant professor starting out, you may not want to squander your resources on a high power attenuator. So you could build your own. And here's a 20 dB attenuator. Uh, if each resistor is a 120 ohm resistor, it should be carbon composition. And here's where you can buy them, at least in the United States. And uh, you put it in a small aluminum box and there you go. It turns out it's 20 dBs if these are each 120 ohms. And by being carbon composition, they've got a lot of heat capacity. They won't blow up on uh, the first pulse you send it. Um, now, if you do this, if you look directly at the radio frequency, attenuated, but it's still at radio frequency, you'll need a scope that's good at radio frequency. And these days, lots and lots of people are at five, 600 and more megahertz. I think even when you start as an assistant professor and such scopes cost money, real money, thousands of dollars. Or you could insert a diode detector in front of the oscilloscope right here, where it says here, insert a diode detector there. So it'll turn the RF into a envelope waveform. And, um, and now you can use any cheap old scope. 
And um, having done this, just by the way, you could look not just at the output where it connects to the probe, you could look at the output of the power amp before the transmit receive switch. You could test the transmit receive switch that way. You could even look right here before it gets to the power amp when it's at the milliwatt level, but there you won't need all the 60 dBs of attenuation. So you can check quite a lot just with a scope and attenuators and see if you get the right thing. Now, when you test the receivers, first off, I want to point out NMR receivers are like NMR itself. They're pretty narrow band. Um, for a solution state machine, the bandwidth might be 10, 20 kilohertz out of 500 megahertz. So the message is get the signal generator running at the right frequency. And um, yeah, get it running close, like within a kilohertz or something. And uh, if the signal generator puts out the typical one milliwatt, that's known as zero decibels above a milliwatt dBm, that's decibels compared to a milliwatt, that's about half a volt peak to peak. And so um, since the receiver ought to be able to see a microvolt RMS, you could even use 107 dBs of attenuation uh, from your generator, and you ought to be able to see it. And not only can you, sorry, can you pump it in here where the probe normally goes, you could pump it in after the transmit receive switch, you could pump it into the preamp, and maybe the preamp's busted, and you could pump it in right here uh, if you made it 30 dBs higher in amplitude, you could pump it right into the spectrometer itself. Well, anyway, you can check all these components. And I suppose it must be said that if you find something wrong, it, it's, it's more ad adventurous to try and tackle it at the circuit board level. You'll probably be going back to the manufacturer. Hey, we've mentioned decibels. And uh, it's a simple logarithmic scale. And uh, here's, here's the and a surprising number of physicists don't do dBs. Um, uh, deci bell is a tenth of a bell. So uh, 10 decibels right here is one bell. And that's a power ratio of 10 to the one. 10 decibels is one bell. That's 10 to the one or 10 is the power ratio. And over here is the voltage ratio, which is the square root, OK? So for example, a 40 dB attenuator knocks the signal down by 40 dBs, four bells. That's 10 to the 4 in power ratio. That's 100 in voltage ratio, OK? Well, all right. and of course, the lovely thing about decibels is that being a logarithmic scale, they're additive or subtractive and not multiplicative. All right. Well, uh, maybe the transmitter passed it. Oh, you know, I, I should have said back here, really, check the noise. Um, the easiest test of the receiver is, is the noise normal? Um, some of us have the pleasure of working with signals so much bigger than the noise that you don't ever see the noise. Well, when the system's working, turn up the gain and see how big the noise is when the thing is working right. If the noise is way, way down, you probably lost a stage of amplification. Sorry. So uh, now that you've tested transmitter and receiver, transmit receive switch, maybe you check the probe. Well, the simplest thing to do is use the tune-up bridge and uh, uh, maybe the coil has become disconnected or Maybe someone screwed up and sent such a long pulse that it melted a solder joint. But anyway, this is low power test. Tune-up bridges work at the milliwatt and below level. And uh, it's a low power test. Now, if you have inline forward and reflected power meters, some people do, some people don't, uh, what do they say? You see, a big reflection, if you pass this test at low power up here, that it, it has, it's tuned and matched just like it was, but at high power, it may be arcing. A big reflection at high power could suggest bad arcing. And by arcing, I mean like a lightning strike inside every time you put on the RF pulse. 
And you could always put in a big signal sample, water, C13 labeled liquid. Uh, and even if the probe is arcing, you'll still see a signal. If you have arcing um, breakdown, you could listen with your ear for the breakdown. If you pulse five times a second, you'll hear snap, 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 snap. You could darken the room and look with your eye for a blue light at the site of the arcing. My recommendation is to do that. You'll need to go to a longer pulse to put some energy in it, like 200 microseconds. And you might do it 10 times a second because we're all impatient waiting for the next pulse. And it's important to note, if you take the can off the probe so that you can hear it and see the arcing, the probe's going to detune. So you'll need to retune it when you take the can off. And uh, yeah, well, you could, you could do this. Not many people do it, but you could replace the probe with a crystal. A crystal is a piezoelectric device that's the heart of every clock that, that's on our wrists, on our walls, in our spectrometers. Um, and here I've selected a crystal running at my resonance frequency. We're a low frequency shop. So the latest thing we did was we broke out a nine megahertz crystal we had laying around. And you can drive it from the spectrometer. And the uh, it's basically like a harmonic oscillator. You hit a pulse and the crystal will be excited and go twang and it'll go twang for a long time, like a millisecond or something. So you'll wanna turn the power down and look for what looks for all the world like a free induction decay be coming from the crystal. Um, you should see this, if you wanna try this, there's an article in J Mag Res by my former student, Sam Emery and myself, and it, it talks about the practical side of this. Uh, crystals are narrow band, but they're usually close to the marked frequency, the frequency that's stamped into their case. So that makes it pretty easy. Although I got to say, you'd have to buy it ahead of time, wouldn't you? Um, um, and if you don't buy it ahead of time, well, you could use a simple test probe. You could use it to check the transmitter by uh, checking its 90 degree pulse length. Of course, this assumes you've done it before when everything was working and you've written it down. And you could look at the amplitude in the receiver of the free induction decay. Is it the same as it was when everything was working? That'd be a great test of the receiving system. And you get to build a simple test probe. Well, um, uh, like I said, especially in South State NMR, where there's a lot of power being run uh, and breakdown is a more common problem in probes, uh, there's an inline watt meter. So between the spectrometer here and the probe over here, there's an inline watt meter or directional watt meter. It uh, samples the forward power and has a diode detector. And that can be run to an oscilloscope, maybe on channel one. And uh, the, it has a sample of the reflected power and a diode detector. And so you'll see that on scope channel two. And if you look at these reflected amplitudes, a good probe will have a picture that looks something like this. A spike, or what my friend Jürgen Haase calls a needle at the start of the pulse. And at the end of the pulse, there'll be a needle, but very little reflected amplitude during the pulse because you've tuned it to look like 50 ohms, no reflection. The reflection at the start and the, and the end is because well, when the probe is ringing up, and ringing down, uh, uh, that part, the right way to say it is, the start and the end of the pulse have sharp discontinuities that contain lots of Fourier components, not all of which are matched for the probe. So the probe reflects a lot of that, okay? And so besides these needles, you'll see a low reflected amplitude. But if the probe is breaking down, well, you'll see, maybe a low reflected amplitude for a little bit of the pulse and then snap, discharge occurs, breakdown, lightning is going on in the probe and there's big reflected amplitude. So that would be a, a great sign of uh, probe breakdown. Now, 
all this talk about tests that you could do means that uh, you'll need test equipment. And you could spend a lot of money, but you don't need it. Uh, the important thing here is you're only going to use this occasionally. In fact, that's really the biggest problem. You'll forget if you don't remind yourself now and then how to turn the signal generator on, how to do the triggering on the oscilloscope and so on. You could go to eBay or you could go to the poor man's eBay. You could borrow from somebody. I warn you, if you borrow occasionally, uh, it may not be available when you need it and you may end up borrowing somebody else's equipment and you're not familiar with it. Anyway, oscilloscope is a must. If you decide you really want to look at the uh, high frequency waveform, 500 megahertz or something, you could spend $10,000. You could maybe buy it used from eBay or something, but that's a lot of money. Or maybe you'll decide, hey, I only need to see the diode detected envelope, the pulse envelope without the RF cycles. Because I don't know anybody who ever looks at the RF cycles and examines them in details and cares about their shape. Um, the diode detected envelope means now it's at a low frequency and you could use a inexpensive oscilloscope, $600 or less. You can buy scopes from, in the United States, Tektronix, Rode Schwarze, and uh, Regal is a Chinese company. If you decide you like this diode detected route, you could buy a diode detector. Um, typically, they have SMA connectors. You need to buy some adapters. They're so-called zero bias shock key diodes. And uh, these uh, professional RF houses, Pasternak, Fairview, they sell you ones that are expensive. You can go to DigiKey, again, in the United States, sorry, and buy one for 34 bucks. Fantastic. And uh, you have to remember that these diode detectors are somewhat fragile. You have to have, oh, maybe at least a milliwatt to see much of anything coming out. And uh, you would sure want to keep it below a watt. So my recommendation is maybe a 10 milliwatt signal going in would be just right. That's plus 10 dBm for those who love decibels. Anyway, you could buy those. Oh, here's an oscilloscope. It's a Tektronix GP. Uh, I think you can buy these now for $500 or they're more modern equivalent. And um, um, oh yeah, they're a liquid crystal display, inexpensive, lightweight. They no longer have to be rolled around on a scope mobile. Uh, here is a, a, a brochure for this uh, uh, S, uh, uh, zero bias Shockey detector sold by DigiKey. And uh, you see it's got SMA connectors and uh, um, yeah, it's freak, more frequency dependent than you would expect, but uh, you'll see something and that's good enough. Hey, maybe you want to check your receivers. So you think now I got to go buy a signal generator. They're made by lots of people. Hewlett Packard, Tektronix, Agilent, Keysight, Rode Schwartz, or you could, you could get these expensive name brands on eBay. Um, but here's a cheaper route. I'm going to encourage you to get a vector network analyzer, VNA. And uh, uh, most of them can be put into a continuous wave signal generating mode. And uh, I, for example, have bought a little um, uh, $60 VNA by this part number. It's available on Amazon. And it, it has a center frequency and a span. Span is the sweep width in frequency. And if you just reduce the span to zero or one kilohertz, it's basically continuous wave. And it makes a nice little one milliwatt signal generator. Now, you could pay a lot of money for a vector network analyzer. I mean, $20,000 and more. Um, or you could go to this company, sdrkits.com, and spend about $500 for this model, Vector Network Analyzer 3. Uh, it plugs into your computer on a USB cable. It comes with no software of its own. You have to download it over the web. And uh, it's a wonderful device made by some ham radio guys, amateur radio guys. 
in Germany and England. And, uh, or here's this uh, 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 made in China, sold by Amazon, $60 buys it. Uh, it's a VNA H4. It's got a nice big screen on it. And uh, the only issue is if you buy this thing, um, if you get stuck setting it up to be what you want, uh, take it to an RF person and say, please help set it up and uh, let it say set up forever. And uh, it comes, at least mine came with a flow chart. So you can navigate your way between all the various software menus and uh, get what you want. Now, this first one from SDR kits is a little tedious because um, it uses the computer, uh, the screen and the keyboard. It needs a computer to do its job. But on the other hand, you've got the computer keyboard to enter all the changes in, that you want. This Nano VNA for $60 is battery operated. That means you can take it into the spectrometer. You don't have to bring a computer to it. It's handheld. Amateur radio guys take it up on their antenna up on the top of the tower to tune it up. But its only drawback is it has this awkward touch screen. And uh, by touch, it needs a little stylus to do the touching. Well, nothing's perfect, I suppose. But anyway, these are low cost things that you should buy. And uh, oh, here's a signal generator from Hewlett Packard. On this one, it reads 000 because the counter doesn't work. But it's a nice signal generator. And you can buy these for, oh, surely less than $1,000 on eBay. And here's my little. Uh, VNWA3, Vector Network Analyzer 3. Uh, it says kits here, SDR kits. Don't let that fool you. Maybe once upon a time, they had you put it together yourself, but not anymore. It comes fully assembled and ready to play. And here's my little uh, Nano VNA. So this is maybe uh, 10 centimeters across. And um, uh, here we are at 11.3 megahertz. Can you do NMR at that low frequency? Yeah. And uh, we, we're displaying the reflection uh, pattern from a, a, a low frequency probe. Over here, it tells you that the output is channel zero. The input is channel one, except if you tell it, I want to do S11 measurements. That's the double E talk for reflection measurements. It sends out on channel zero and it listens for the reflection on channel zero. That's what we almost always use. And there's a cursor here, one, that you can slide around and read the exact frequency of the dip. Okay. Nice little device. And you know, it's 60 bucks. You can't go wrong. It's rechargeable from your computer. Uh, if you want to buy attenuators and filters, you can go to these people, Mini Circuits Labs, JFW. Uh, some of this stuff is sold by DigiKey, which is really convenient. Uh, if you want to get an inline directional watt meter, um, Bird is the oldest name in the field, and uh, they're great. And uh, my German friend has an EME Precision, this model, but you have to use diode detectors and oscilloscope to see it. All right but you can have a directional watt meter. Oh, speaking of attenuators at power, here's a very homemade in an aluminum box, little uh, carbon composition resistors, 20 dB attenuator. Here's some commercial five and 15 dB attenuators, all right? Well, now, after all that, I just have to give you advice. It's, it's, it's the disease of having an old man speak to you. Uh, you got to try it first. When it's all working, try these various things. Try hooking an oscilloscope up. Try using the vector network analyzer, the signal generator. Because if you don't, you'll say, how do I turn the signal generator on? How do I get the damned oscilloscope to trigger? And you should, by the way, always use the external trigger so you know it's triggering right. So you, you need to try all this stuff. and. Um, you also should write things down. I find uh, I forget. <laughs> and in debugging something, I'll take this cable off the amplifier and put the scope there. And well, I should have a list. As I disconnect the cable, 
write it down. If I change the settings to a 200 microsecond pulse, write it down so that if I, I have a record, so when it's all working again into the oscilloscope, I can hook it all back up and do NMR without blowing up my probe or something else because I put all the settings back to what they should be. Um, like a lot of good advice, it's easy to say and hard to make yourself do it, but I really recommend this. Try it first so you get experience with your test equipment and write all your changes down. Keep notes. How big was the signal from the transmitter when I went through how many dBs of attenuation? So if, if the transmitter isn't dead, but just failing sick, you'll say, oh, it's only half as big as it used to be. I believe this is a real change. So let's change direction and talk about building a simple probe. Um, the probes that come from the commercial manufacturers are very polished and very pretty, uh, but it's not rocket science and you can learn to do it too. And the only way you're gonna learn is to do it, to try something. Um, my recommendation is if this is the first probe you've built, keep it simple. Don't do a triple resonance. Uh, uh, probably not a magic angle spinning probe because you'd have to find a magic angle spinning head because you probably didn't want to make your own. It's not easy. Uh, you might read this article. It's intended for you in this position. Dustin Wheeler uh, was a student in Sophia Hayes group and he worked and, and wrote this article in Concepts and Magnetic Resonance. And uh, it's sort of like uh, nine easy exercises to develop some intuition for probe building. And uh, this is a journal that's not taken by every library. If you can't find it, let me know. I can send you a copy. Uh, you'll need to have a, a box, a shielding enclosure. You're going to stick it up the magnet bore and uh, you're going to need something to hold it there, some shielding. Uh, so even though it's not fun, like building electronic probe circuits, you got to figure out the mechanical aspect. How are you going to hold the box? How are you going to take put the cover on the box? How are you going to hold it all up there in the center of the magnet? Hey, you know where the center of the magnet is? That's important. And uh, again, old man advice, every part, every part that goes into the probe, you need to check it for magnetism. So I have a little handheld permanent magnet and every screw, every capacitor uh, gets tested for magnetism just to see if the part sticks or shows any attraction to the magnet. Um, the, the darndest things are magnetic. Some screws that look like brass are really chromate, zinc chromate plated steel. Not good, not good at all. Uh, some capacitors uh, have uh, nickel plating involved and are magnetic. So uh, be careful, check every piece. So once you've done the mechanical part, you're gonna wind a suitable coil. And uh, here um, I've got a, a, a solenoid of length script L and uh, diameter twice the radius R. And uh, here's the resonance condition, some capacitor that'll go across here and resonate this coil. And omega, I remind you, is two pi times the ordinary frequency. And uh, here's a formula from an amateur radio handbook or maybe Aichi Fukushima's book on the subject. And here's the inductance L and microhenries given by this formula ends the number of turns. Little r and script L are the lengths in inches. Sorry, that's the way I remember it. And uh, if you wind a typical coil for whatever frequency, it often has an inductive impedance, omega L, of 50 to 100 ohms, it can be whatever you want. But if it's 10,000 ohms, you, you, you're, it's way too big. And if it's one ohm, it's way too small. And so uh, not only is uh, omega L uh, uh, this impedance, but the capacitive impedance is the same value because that's what this equation up here says, omega squared LC is one. OK, so you wind yourself a suitable coil and you stick a suitable capacitor across it. Maybe it's variable, maybe it's fixed and you wanna know where it resonates. So um, the first thing you do is you uh, take a coax cable and put a little loop on the end of it 
and you hook it to port one of your vector network analyzer, it's measuring reflection. And uh, this little loop ought to have a diameter more or less, more or less equal to that of the coil. And you bring it close, kind of like I've shown here, and you'll see a dip in the reflection at the resonance frequency of the coil with this capacitor. So maybe you can adjust the capacitor to get this to where you want. Or maybe if you're soldering on test capacitors, you'll have to solder on a few different ones to get it where you want. Anyway, uh, the dip is the frequency where omega square LC is one. Oh yeah, Kong Tan uh, said, hey, how do you bench tune traps for a, if you want to change the frequency of a probe? Well, this is what you do. You'd lay the, 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 the coil capacitor assembly on the bench, or if you were being fussy, you'd put on a piece of foam to get rid of dielectric effects, and uh, you'd uh, sniff its resonance. And maybe this trap is part of a double or triple resonance probe, huh? Now, this is my view of why we tune and match coils. Um, the impedance of the coil, uh, it's got inductance and is always, because it's wound of copper or something, has some series resistance. It's I omega L plus R. R is real, it's the lossy part, the real resistance, and the inductive reactance is imaginary because the current and voltage are 90 degrees out of phase. That's what the I square root of one, square root of minus one signifies. And a typical coil might have an impedance of I times 100 ohms plus one ohm resistive. Oh yeah, I gotta tell you, if you just measure this coil with an ohm meter, you won't measure one ohm you'll measure much less because the resistance R is much greater at radio frequency because skin depth applies. The current only travels in the skin of the wire, whereas a DC with your ohm meter, it travels through the whole bulk of the wire and you get a much lower resistance. Well, anyway, Q is the ratio of the inductive reactance, omega L to the resistance. And here in my example, it's 100, yeah, not, not untypical. Now, you want to transform, you want to do something to this coil. You want to transform it so it's matched to 50 ohms resistive. You see your transmitter and receiver preamplifier are made to work with 50 ohms. It's an industry standard. And uh, you want to transform the impedance of the coil so it looks like I times zero, no reactants, plus 50. Well, it's a long way from it now, isn't it? So the first thing we'll do is we'll add a capacitance in series with the inductor and uh, we'll choose a capacitance so it satisfies this expression, omega square LC is one, which means uh, the inductive reactance, I omega L and the capacitive reactance minus I over omega C add to zero. This minus I 100 and this I 100 add to zero and you're left with a one ohm real resistance. Well. You're not done. You're not at 50 ohms yet, but at least you got rid of the reactants. So that's what tuning is about. You get rid of the reactants. But we're going to have to step up this impedance from one ohm to 50 ohms. So let me take a side step here and talk to you a little bit about transformers. And this is true whether it's a wall wart transformer that's powering something uh, in your lab or it's the transformer on the electricity pole. Um, <clears throat> here there's a, some turns typically wrapped around for power, uh, iron core. There's a, a turns wrapped around a core and uh, for the primary and a different number of turns in the secondary. And for every one turn in the primary, there's N turns in the secondary. I'm assume here N is greater than one. And uh, that makes it a step up. They all see the same magnetic flux every one of these turns. So the voltage induced in the secondary is 10 times bigger than the primary. It's a voltage step up. But the current in the load in the secondary is one over N as much as the primary. Simple rules, it's because power is conserved, I mean, for a perfect transformer, huh? So voltage times current or power is conserved. So if you step up the voltage by N, you step down the current by N, okay? Now we're interested in what happens to impedances. 
impedance is the ratio of voltage to current, just like resistance in Ohm's law. So the impedance on the secondary side, the voltage is bigger by N, the current is smaller by N compared to the primary. So the impedance is stepped up by N squared. Take home message, if a transformer steps up the voltage by N, it steps down the current by N, and it steps up the impedance by N squared. Okay? So here's a real common geometry uh, uh, used in probes. And uh, here's the NMR coil. It's shown with a little series resistance because there's some loss. It's got a tuning capacitor marked HV. It's going to have to hold high voltage and uh, when the transmitter is going and a coupling capacitor. And typically, typically, the coupling capacitor is small compared to the tuning capacitor. And this hooks over here to the 50 ohm spectrometer. And uh, so here's the 50 ohm spectrometer shown as 50 ohms. And uh, I show current going down through the inductor here and then either going up through this uh, tuning capacitor or a smaller amount of it going up through the, the spectrometer and the coupling cap, okay? Now here's the rule. The impedance is going to be matched if and only if the dissipation in this internal loss in the coil R matches equals the dissipation of energy in the 50 ohm resistor. Now, if you, if you get that condition, then the impedance looking into this tuned circuit is 50 ohms. It's impedance matched. You'll get the most power out of your transmitter, get the most signal into your receiving system for the biggest NMR signals. So uh, it says the power dissipated over here. Well, that's the current through the coil, I sub L, I squared times R. I square R is power. And so here's the current through the coil squared times its resistance. And that has to equal the current through the 50 ohm resistor squared, I 50 squared, times the 50 ohm resistor. Well, that's all it, it is. And if you uh, do a little arithmetic, you get this. And uh, if you take the square root, you get the ratio of the current in the 50 ohms to the current in the coil. That's the current step down factor. And uh, that'll equal um, uh, the square root of this, square root R over 50. In all our examples, R was one ohm in series with the coil, sort of typical. And the square root of 1 50th is a seventh, right? A seventh. And uh, you adjust this uh, current ratio by, uh, uh, let's see, if you make C couple smaller, it's got a higher impedance and that makes smaller current through the 50 ohm resistor. So the current ratio is the ratio of these capacitors, the coupling cap to the total cap. Now, maybe this strikes you as different than the way you learned electronics. It is, uh, but it's the same result, but a lot easier. You see right here, this asterisk, you could say, what do I need to learn Conradi's rules for? I could just add the impedances of the coil and the resistor in series and then in parallel with the tuning capacitor and then in series with the coupling capacitor. I could just add them in series in parallel. There's usual rules we learn in a physics course, but it's a mess. It's a big hairy expression and you look at it and your first reaction is I get no take home message from that expression at all. Or instead you could try these rules. Omega square LC total is one. C total is the parallel, the sum of the coupling cap and the tuning cap. And that's usually the biggest part is the tuning cap. And the ratio of these capacitances is this ratio square root R over 50 or in our case, a seventh. So um, uh, the coupling cap will be one unit of capacitance and the tuning cap will be six units. So that this ratio is one seventh. That's easy enough. But there are a lot of ways to match to coils. So I'm going to uh, do another sidestep and tell you a little bit of an equivalence here. Uh, if you represent the losses in this coil as a series resistance, that makes sense because the copper wire is in series with the coil. 
But remember, this resistance is not just the DC resistance. It's larger because it travels, the current only travels in the skin. Anyway, you could make an equivalent representation where an ideal coil L prime is got a large resistance capital R in parallel with it. So no loss over here means little r equals zero. No loss over here means capital R equals infinity. And if you write these down, add them in series, add them in parallel, insist that they be the same or equivalent, you discover that basically, uh, as long as the Q is high, L prime and L have to be the same. That was easy enough. It's a first order. And the product of capital R and little r has to equal omega L squared. Another way to say that is omega L is the geometric mean of little r and big R. Here it's written a different way. And if, the, if represented this way, the Q is omega L over little r. Represented this way in parallel, the Q is capital R over omega L. That's the same thing as this equation up here. And so remembered this way, just when you do this equivalence, the Q has to be the same. Yeah, Q is a dimensionless number. Okay, so if I take my typical coil with reactants I times 100 at our frequency, whatever that is, and it's got a one ohm series loss, that's a Q of 100. That's equivalent to an I times 100 inductor, same inductance, in parallel with 10,000 ohms. And you think, well, that's a fine note. See, over here, when we represented it this way and we tuned out the reactants, we were left with one ohm. And that's a far cry from 50 ohms. And over here, if you parallel resonate it with a capacitor, uh, then this capacitance and inductance will disappear and you'll just be left with 10,000 ohms in this representation. And that's a far cry from 50 ohms. So, but now we can look and say, let's step down the impedance of, from 10,000 ohms down to 50 ohms. So here's a standard step down circuit. It's got a tuning capacitor and a matching capacitor. Typically this matching capacitor is much larger capacitance than this one. Only this tuning capacitor will get the high voltage on it, it turns out much higher than comes out of the transmitter. And uh, we need to step down now from this 10,000 ohms down to 50. And uh, let's see. Oh yeah, uh, these two capacitors, the tuning and the matching are basically in series. So here I've used the usual formula to add them in series. That series combination has to resonate L at our frequency. Okay, simple formula, the series value the series sum of the two capacitors has to resonate L. And basically, that's roughly uh, the smaller of the two. That's the tuning capacitor has to resonate L. Okay. And now if we want to step down the impedance from 10,000 ohms to 50 ohms, that's 200 to 1 step down in impedance. That's a square root of 200, 14, 14 to 1 step down in voltage. 14 to 1 step down in voltage. So that means you'll need 13 units of voltage across here for every one unit of voltage across here. And remembering that impedance is inverse in capacitance, that means you need to have this be 13 times the capacitance of this, okay? Roughly, the ratio of C2 to C match is roughly 14, one, one to 14, excuse me. So that's a common way to match. In fact, there's lots of ways. We just got done talking about this way. And you could regard this as you let the uh, current in the coil slosh through this capacitive reactance to generate a little voltage, to generate 1 14th of the total voltage across the coil. Well, it doesn't have to be a capacitive reactance. It could be an inductive reactance down here. And uh, so you use a small inductance and uh, 
roughly a 14th of this inductance. And uh, that'll step down the impedance uh, to be looking like 50 ohms. And because it's a small inductance, presumably the losses in this additional inductor are pretty negligible. Well, here L prime and L are in series. They could be part of the same coil and you could just tap solder onto one of the turns of the coil and um, uh, if you think of uh, 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 this as an auto transformer where it's a, a three leaded transformer um, you just adjust the position of this tap you slide it up the coil to get more coupling or slide it down the coil to get less coupling and it's nice and easy and it involves no expensive components at all. In fact, sometimes this part of the inductor down here, the, the part that's L prime, L prime, uh, is just the wire that connects it to the rest of the circuit. There's enough stray inductance in the wire. And if this is an auto transformer, here's a regular transformer. You could hook your 50 ohms over here and just inductively couple no direct connection to the NMR coil at all. Uh, uh, my colleague Toby Zenz loves inductive coupling because of the freedom it gives you to put ground wherever you want it, and uh, or not at all. And uh, you just adjust the coupling by bringing this link or loop closer or further away until it's uh, appropriately matched to 50 ohms. Nice, simple, inexpensive. There are a lot of ways to match to 50 ohms. So you have two separate jobs in the probe design. Tune, so it's resonant at the desired frequency, and, and then match to 50 ohms, and you have lots of choices as to how you'll do that matching. Oh, here's some pictures. Uh, here's a three millimeter ID in diameter coil, three millimeters, so it's maybe six millimeters long, and it's wound of enameled wire, and there's something stuffed into it. It's a little plant sample. And uh, here's a piston trimmer uh, from Voltronics, I believe, and a fixed capacitor in parallel with it. And uh, like I said, this is a three millimeter inner diameter. So this whole thing is about in 25 millimeters or an inch. And this uh, red and white cable is a transmission line, believe it or not, hooked to ground here and hooked to the top of this wire. And you think this is stupid. This wire goes straight down here to ground. Well, there's inductance in this wire. And uh, the red and the white wire, ground and hot, are not hooked together. There's an inductance between them. Just like over here. That straight wire is L prime. And it's uh, just the right length to make it look like 50 ohms. And uh, the rest of all this stuff here is tape and uh, plexiglass tubing. Um, yeah. And uh, here's our plastic box. It's an imaging probe. And so instead of being made of aluminum, which would have huge uh, eddy currents from the gradients when they're switched on and off, it's made of plastic. And we use a thin copper foil as the shielding. And here's a BNC connector and the red and white transmission line going over here to the coil. All right. Here's a low frequency system. This is 11 megahertz. Uh, here's the coil with a test tube of oil stuck in it. Uh, these capacitors, <laughs> we bought a lot of them because they're non-magnetic, made by Panasonic, and it's getting harder and harder to find non-magnetic capacitors, okay? And uh, they're in series parallel in an arrangement that resonates this. The final fine tuning is this air variable radio style capacitor radio style tuning capacitor. And uh, the whole thing is an aluminum box because it's not for imaging. If you if you go to buy, if you go to make a probe, you're going to want to buy some non-magnetic capacitor, capacitors, excuse me. Polyflon, a New Jersey company, makes Teflon insulated piston trimmers. A Digikey, who stock almost everything in their catalog, sell Spray Goodman ceramic piston trimmers and other piston trimmer capacitors. DigiKey sells chip capacitors that are non-magnetic 
and easy to solder. Um, this is quite a trick. They have copper barriers instead of nickel magnetic barriers and they're high voltage. The brand name is Knowles Cipher. And uh, the lovely thing here is uh, you can get three kilovolt ratings and you can buy them by the ones, twos, threes, as few as you want. So the days of having to buy 50 of these for each value you want are gone. Um, and, and, you, and you can find other uh, um, less expensive capacitors as well. But I think these, these little ciphers cost three, three or $4 each or something. Well, anyway, that's what I have to tell you. And I hope you try this and uh, I hope you enjoy it. By the way, th this talk was recorded and uh, my slides are on file. And, uh, and like I said, if you need the concepts article, I'd be happy to send it to you. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you, Mark. That was a really great talk. Uh, I, I can already see myself in the future going over this uh, at least a few more times. There's a lot of great detail. Um, I'm going to sneak in a quick question before we get to the Q&A. We already have a couple questions there. If you have uh, more questions for Mark, uh, please add those to the list. Uh, so you, you mentioned uh, near the end there that there's uh, lots of ways to uh, match. And so I was just curious if there is a clear best way in your opinion to set up the matching uh, and or just like out of convenience uh, one that you find to be uh, the best and and or what the pros and cons what's what's the reason might be the best in your opinion um they're all essentially the same okay. um, be, uh, this has a slight disadvantage in that l prime probably has its own loss certainly has its own loss it's small inductance compared to l Oh, there's there's my cursor and oh i'm sorry I, I lost my red cursor somehow anyway l is the nmr coil it's wrapped mm -hmm. around the sample l prime is less inductance and you could make it physically larger so it probably has a negligible loss compared to l okay so not bad uh, this many people look at and go i don't like it because i'm not hooked up to the tuned circuit well, you are, you're hooked up magnetically. And um, uh, even though there's no direct electrical connection, there's a magnetic connection and it works just as well. Uh, Toby Zenz has written uh, uh, an article or two in JMAGRES about uh, inductive coupling. And he uses it not just for coupling, but for tuning. And it allows him to uh, make this probe circuit balanced with respect to ground gives them a lot of freedom. So it's just a matter of convenience. All right, makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, so moving to the Q&A, uh, we have from uh, David Halap. Uh, thanks for this great talk. I've had to use uh, most of this equipment, but not RF power detectors. Can you remind me in what specific situations uh, you use them, e.g. for testing the B1 field? You, you could. I mean, Anywhere where you would want to look at the RF, a sample of the radio frequency, say from the transmitter, mm -hmm. attenuated, or some people have a little sniffer coil in their probe where they can directly see the B1. It allows them, for example, to test the whole transmitting chain all the way from the transmitter, the transmit receive switch into the probe and the coil all in one shot. You just say, is, is my sniffer coil getting the right amount? You could look at the RF, but since many people are doing NMR at 500 megahertz and above, and I hear people saying, you mean you're not? We're well, low frequency. Uh, and since they're at high frequency, it's sort of an unnecessary expense to have the oscilloscope be able to see 500 megahertz when you could just diode detect it and get its envelope, okay? So anywhere where you'd wanna look at the because what most people do with the oscilloscope in those cases they just look at the envelope on the screen well who needs the rf cycles just use the diode detector and an inexpensive oscilloscope will do just fine did that answer your question um i think that it did but we'll let david uh <clears throat> chime in again if uh if he has more uh question to ask um oh yeah he says yes it did thanks great <clears throat> All right, so from DR, I'm not sure if that's a uh, title or initials, but uh, I need to use a heater and Cernox sensor in my probe head, but 
When I connect the temperature controller to my probe and turn on the temperature controller, the noise increases a lot, uh, circa wow. 10 times. Uh, any way to get rid of this noise clearly uh, added by the temperature controller? Yeah. Um, by the way, is, is Cernox a magnetic material? Not sure. Well, anyway, that's yeah. a separate problem. Yeah. Um, there's the people bringing in things that are supposed to work at low frequency. A thermometer, a heater typically work at low frequency, uh, almost always, either DC or 60 hertz AC. Um, you, you could have a low pass filter. So capacitor to ground, an inductor in series with it, and another capacitor to ground. On every lead entering the uh, precious RF head, okay? So you could put that at the bottom of the probe where the thing goes into the magnet, or you could even put it on the bottom of the probe can where it enters the, the probe RF section itself. But low pass filtering is capacitors to ground and inductors in series with the path. So it shorts, it's sort of like killing it twice or three times. It shorts the RF part to ground typically a thousand picofarads would be an RF short for uh, our frequencies. Uh, if you have a one microhenry coil, that's a blocking impedance for RF, but no problem at DC. And then another thousand picofarads to ground would short whatever got through. So it's uh, uh, like a good defense in football, it's uh, multiple layers, All right? And if, and if it's only increasing the noise, a factor of 10, a C, L, C, that, that's a pi network, isn't it? If you think of the pi symbol. So a C to ground, an L in series, and a C to ground. Mm -hmm. uh, pi filters on each lead. And so the, how many leads would there be? There'd be the two heaters and the, maybe two leads to the Cernox sensor, huh? Hope it works. Yeah. Uh, so then DR has a second question uh, that is, uh, Let's see. The other companies then, are there any other companies than uh, Voltronics which sell uh, cryogenic uh, tunable capacitors? Uh, Polyflon. Oh, cryogenic. You know, I believe I looked on Polyflon the, the last time I wanted to do business with them. They were moving from one location to another. So it was going to be a long wait. And I'm mm -hmm. an impatient person. But uh, they have pro products that have, I think, are spec to work at cryogenic temperatures. And I know Voltronics does. And I know Voltronics uh, is stocked. Some of their parts are stocked by DigiKey. And Sprague Goodman has DigiKey parts. It's a funny thing. They have lots of stock at DigiKey. But mm -hmm. when you go, they're listed as obsolete. Like Sprague Goodman uh, is getting out of the business of making these but they have non-magnetic trimmer capacitors with exceptionally high voltage ratings. And I don't know how good they are at cryogenic temperatures, but being ceramic, you'd think they'd be just fine. You would think the metal tuning, the metal tuning slug would contract more than the ceramic sleeve around it. Ceramics yeah. being fairly low contraction. All right, uh, and then we have a question here from Adam G, or maybe let's uh, let's see, Ten Kong uh, has a uh, kind of follow up on that, saying spray gun uh, capacitors uh, work for us at helium temperatures, and so we've used them in our lab in Paris. So that's great. Uh, so Kong, uh, thank you for that for that weigh in. Yeah. Um, and then uh, so question from Adam. Uh, do you have any tricks and tips for building or buying duplexes? Um, I was going to say I've never bought a duplexer in my life, but um, uh, I have. Uh, we bought a recently a tech mag and, and they came with a duplexer on it. Uh, I, I suppose maybe they would sell you one. Um, I know they prefer to sell you the whole thing, but you could write to tech mag in Houston, Texas. They might. Um, uh, there are designs in Aichi Fukushima's book that are the classical uh, use of uh, silicon PN junction diodes, little so-called small signal diodes. Uh, 
1N4148. That's 1N4148 is a perfectly good number. There's lots of other good numbers um, and uh, for diodes. And they typically have a quarter wave cable or for us low frequency people, a lumped element version of a quarter wave cable. And uh, they're, they're, they work as advertised. Uh, the mm -hmm. only warnings being, if you were like uh, doing, a, I wouldn't want to run my decoupling power through the TR switch. Makes because sense. that's, there's no need to, you're decoupling, you're not receiving at that frequency. And uh, the long pulses can be hard on the diodes. Oh yeah, one other thing I like to do is put an RF fuse. That's just an ordinary fuse in, in a small box in series with the transmitter output. So that if I do something really, really stupid and, and or, or maybe I could blame it on the computer, the computer does something stupid and gives a five second long pulse. Or maybe when I wrote five microseconds for the pulse width, I forgot to enter the U for microsecond and it interprets it as five seconds. That'll burn out a whole stack of diodes in a hurry, but better it burns out the fuse because they're cheap. Agreed. That's a good, uh, a good thing to keep in mind. As much as uh, I like to think that I, I don't make mistakes, I know I do, so. <laughs> um, then we have uh, another talk or another uh, question here from uh, uh, Dave uh, Crenshaw uh, saying, great talk, very helpful. Uh, if a probe regularly detunes after pulsing rapidly multiple times, mm. would that suggest an electrical failure or something more mechanical? I think electrical. It sounds like breakdown, uh, moving metal around on, 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 on a capacitor or something. I've seen such things, been a little mystified by them, but they're fixed by replacing the bad capacitor. Mm. And how do you find out which is the bad one? Pretty hard. Uh, you were small. Uh, That'd be sense. the sure or replace them one by one, a little tedious. Yeah. Um, um, it's, it's hard to conveniently generate those large RF voltages, except in a tuned circuit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, then we have a quick comment from uh, John Price saying, uh, thanks for the, for the talk. And uh, then we have uh, an anonymous attendee asking, uh, why does the inductive impedance of the probe coil need to be in that 10 to 100 ohm range? Well, if it's 10,000 ohms, it's likely that the uh, stray capacitance just between the wire ends of the coil will be already more capacitance than you need to resonate that huge inductor, OK? You'll have a huge voltage across the coil, and uh, you'll have breakdown city. Okay. If you go to lower and lower inductances, the voltage level drops. Um, the voltage level drops, so breakdown is less of a problem. But ordinarily, uh, if you if you wound a, a coil with so small an inductance that its reactance was one ohm, the inductance of the lead wires would be more than the inductance of the coil itself. And so all your stored energy, most of it, would be in the lead wires and not in the coil itself. Now, you can do things that are extreme, like you can locate little chip capacitors right on the coil itself. Um, yeah, you can do that. Uh, that's OK. And then there are no lead wires. And so you could use a very low inductance. In fact, if it was a if it was a, my hands, if it was a band uh -huh, like this with a gap and you could put capacitors right here between the ends of the gap, well that you can do that. Um, it's very low inductance, but for ordinary purposes, coils that are between 10 and 100 or a couple hundred ohms are, are sort of easy to work with. So there's no, no hard and fast rule that you can't. It just seems to be the sweet spot in the end. Yeah. OK. All right, so then we have a, I'm just going to bounce ahead a little bit, quick follow up from Dave saying, oof, afraid, I was afraid of that. And thank you very much for, for your comments. 
then we have a question from anonymous attendee uh, saying, can the probe uh, shock us while looking for an arc? And if so, uh, is it dangerous? Also, what is the best way to prevent the probe from arcing? Oh, uh, keep the voltage level down. Um, use no more transmitter power than you really need for your experiment. Don't, 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 re don't regard having a one microsecond 90 as a mark of your manliness. Um, uh, uh, keep helium gas away, helium arcs easily. No sharp points. Sharp points are like lightning, lightning rods. Lightning <laughs> rods. Yeah. yeah. Uh, keep parts away from each other. Uh, but you said uh, the first part of the question was, I'm sorry. So uh, can the probe shock us while looking for an arc? And then if so, is it dangerous? So, uh, so yeah. Typically, if you touch something on the probe, you'll so detune it that it won't give you much voltage. And okay. typically, you're not running continuous wave a thousand watts. You're not trying to melt the coil. You're not running continuous wave. You're running pulses with maybe a 1% or one tenth of one percent duty cycle. So uh, if you feel a tingle, that's about all. On the other hand, caution is, is worthwhile because um, something could go wrong with your transmitter, with your computer, and it could give out a long transmit pulse, which could hurt you, okay? Um, so some degree of caution, but I don't know anyone who's ever said ow from the RF. Oh, good to keep in mind. Uh, and then uh, our final question here is from Kong saying, uh, great talk, Mark. Uh, what do you think of using superconducting wire for making very high QRF coils or small r? Oh, boy. Um, uh, oh, and I think Kong weighed in that he was at low temperatures. And so superconducting is a possible. Um, if you do use superconducting wire, you can get great sensitivity, right? The Q is high. Um, there's a group at Florida State, Tallahassee. They're part of the National High Magnetic Field Lab. And um, Professor Bray runs this effort. And it has, and Ilya Litvak is part of the effort. And they're exploring high temperature superconducting coils. So they have them at liquid nitrogen temperatures, as I recall, and they get great spin sensitivity. Um, for that application, where the coil is cold, but the sample is probably not, uh, you have to have some thermal insulation like vacuum between the two. So the filling factor goes down. But for Kong, who's already at low temperature with a low temperature sample, he doesn't need any thermal insulation between the coil and the sample, I suppose. And uh, so he doesn't lose from filling factor. He only gains from the high Q. But here's, there's always a but. Uh, uh, this high Q coil will ring for a long time. The ringing time is proportional to the Q. And, and um, if this is a ordinary thing to go from 100 watts transmit pulse down to one microvolt at the receiver or something like that. It's like uh, 18 orders of magnitude in in uh, volt in, in power, nine orders of magnitude in voltage. It's a lot of ringing. And so you'll need to use some kind of a Q switch. Um, the only Q switches I know of use ordinary devices, I guess you could use gallium arsenide FETs as part of the Q switch. They continue to work at low temperature. Um, it's, it's intriguing, but you'll, you'll need to deal with the ringing somehow. Because I'll bet it's Fort Kelvin. He's looking at solids. Yeah. <laughs> I look forward to hearing more how that goes, Kong. Um, uh, then we have another question here. Uh, from an anonymous uh, attendee saying, is there a way to check the RF inhomogeneity uh, of a handmade coil? I like a good way to do that. Yeah. Um, my colleague, Toby Zenz, would say, put it out on the bench because it may not be very convenient to, to do it in the actual probe. 
but put mm -hmm. it out in the bench, make a tuned circuit out of it, and use the ball shift method. He has a little conducting non-magnetic sphere of brass or copper or aluminum. These can be bought from McMaster Car. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's sized to be a substantial part of the diameter of the coil, but not all of it. If it's too small, what, what, here's the idea. You insert this little ball on the end of a insulating stick, like a little plastic wand and it's, the little conducting sphere is glued onto the end. And you stick it in there and the eddy currents that are induced are of course proportional to the B1 field. And uh, uh, it causes the inductance to decrease. It's a general rule, eddy currents always cause inductance to decrease. And so the resonance frequency that you measure with your vector network analyzer goes up, okay? And you measure this shift as you move the ball around inside the coil. And ideal would be whenever it's inside the coil, you get the same shift until it leaves the coil. And then there's no shift. But Maxwell, I was going to say God, but Maxwell didn't allow that in his equations. And so typically there's a fringe field on the outside and there's some variation of field inside the coil. Um, and that would be a good way, for example, to wind a coil if you wanted to have a N-corrected solenoid with a really uniform field. At five and 600 megahertz, that's harder and harder to do, but uh, you could measure it that way. Um, of course, you could just do NMR on a small sample and measure that and, and move that small sample around. But that does sound like you'd need a contrivance, a mechanical jig. So you could move the sample around while it was in the probe, while it was in the magnet, or God forbid, you'd have to move the sample with the probe out of the magnet and then put the whole back in the magnet and do that for 12 points. I guess you could do that too. But that seems like a maybe a little bit rougher, but you know, which, whichever uh, uh, works. <laughs> one other way is mm -hmm. if you had, if you just wanted, for example, the axial variation of field along a coil, um, you could do an imaging experiment. Um, many, many high resolution probes anyway are equipped for imaging. And you could do a, a, a spatially resolved uh, measurement, a nutation measurement. And uh, so at each location along the axis of the coil, you would get the B1. Now that'd be a straightforward way, but I guess most solid state rigs don't have grad coils on them. Uh, you know what you could do? Um, you could do all this with a static, static gradient. You know, the problem is the shielding can on the, on the probe uh, yeah. will not allow internal pulsed gradients, but they do allow continuous wave DC mm. gradients. And you could do it that way. Impose a modest DC gradient in the direction of the axis of the coil and uh, do your nutation experiment that way. All right. We have a couple comments here in the chat that I'll uh, also I mentioned. So Jeff Reimer says, uh, thanks, uh, Mark, for always a joy to hear you speak. And Chuan Shan says, thank you so much. Very useful talk. And we have a, an extra question that snuck in there uh, from Vincent uh, Saru Kanyan uh, saying, uh, you present very important knowledge about RF to build a, an NMR probe. What is your opinion about gradient coil, uh, just 1DZ gradient? Is there, are there any difficulties to build a high gradient coils greater than hundreds of gauss per centimeter? And thanks a lot. Speaking of gradient coils. Oh, wow. Uh, um, uh, the first question we just talked about is, uh, is this coil going to be located inside the shielding can, or outside the shielding can? Or like many small animal experiments, there's no shielding can at all. Right, yeah. so there are no worries about gradients, eddy currents. Yeah. Um, if you uh, really want hundreds or more of Gauss per centimeter, my advice first off is think small. And everything I told in earlier question about here comes the, the, the gradient 
current into the coil, it's at low frequency. The pulse waveforms have low frequencies. You need to RF bypass it because you want these coil, this grad coil right close to the your RF sample. The smaller the grad coils, the hotter they are. Um, I seem to remember doing the arithmetic and, and saying um, the, 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 the power required goes as R cubed. So you can get by with a lot less gradient power for smaller coils. And the stored energy in a gradient coil for a given gradient was uh, one over the length, characteristic length to the fifth power. So as you make this length, uh, gee, I got the one over wrong. It goes as length to the fifth. So smaller coils have less stored energy, less dissipated power. They're better far and away. Um, that's a better route than going and trying to make it with water cooling or something like that, because that's awkward. Um, why? What are you trying to do? Uh, let's see. Vincent, if you have, if you're still here. Yep. Uh, you can go ahead and add it either in the chat or the Q&A. I can't imagine having a water cooling uh, system to be particularly efficient. Uh, was my uh, okay, here we see. Uh, add a gradient coil around a standard bore probe is what Vincent is interested in doing. And if it's a standard around a standard bore probe, sounds like it's on the outside of the shielding can, right? Yeah. It's really so he'll like. have to deal with the eddy currents, which will be substantial. Because when they make the shielding can, they're not worried about this at all. And mm -hmm. if it's 16th inch aluminum, oh, it's great. Uh, you could make your own shielding can out of plastic, a trip to the machine shop, a little money, mm -hmm. and wrap it with uh, 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 um, glue on, um, tacky uh, copper sheet, 3M sells copper sheet that's got. Um, adhesive on one side and uh, you could uh, have your shielding be that being a very thin conductor it would have much less eddy current troubles mm -hmm. um, um, such eddy currents die out in something like half a millisecond and then vincent also added that's a four centimeter free internal diameter uh, well you could put his coil inside you have to mount it rigidly um, because then, there are uh, forces and torques on it. Yeah, we have a, a couple extra uh, questions that have popped up from anonymous attendees. And then I think after this, uh, we'll probably wrap up. But uh, if you want to use a non-copper coil, what would be the best alternative? Oh, uh, if, if the issue is you don't want copper because of copper nuclei, I know a lot of people use silver. Uh -huh. Um, silver, it has a spins, <laughs> they're even spin a half. They're just really, really low gamma. And yeah. uh, so silver is a, and in fact, is a better conductor than copper. And the whole, the whole issue will be, I don't have a lot of sizes of silver wire in the lab, right? Yeah. Um, for high temperature, some people like non-copper. And I've seen, oh, people going to tantalum and yeah, tantalum is the one I, uh, niobe, uh, there you have to be very careful because when they're hot, they will oxidize like crazy. And so you have to run them in an inert atmosphere. Oh, um, and some people use aluminum, um, but you can't solder to it. You have to clamp to it. Um, and, and it's been, Aluminum 27 is not that far away from where copper 63 and 65 are. So. And then we have a, so our final question uh, saying, great talk. Uh, could you please talk a little bit about the problems which can arise due to a large stray capacitance in the RF coil? Um, well, it's the first approximation. Stray capacitance from the coil 
to the surrounding shield can ground. It's just in parallel with the rest of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But it may prevent, the straight capacitance may prevent you from resonating that coil as at as high a frequency as you'd like. Sometimes the straight capacitance is too big. Um, another issue is lots of people use Hartman Hahn matching or more modern versions thereof uh, for uh, cross polarization. And there's an implicit assumption uh, that the same current travels through every turn of the wire, whether you're at low frequency or high. So the field plot of the coil, the B1 distribution is the same at low frequency or high. And so if you're Hartmann-Hahn matched in the center of the coil, you're Hartmann-Hahn matched at the edge of the coil. That falls apart when there's a stray capacitance. So the current in every turn is not the same because the stray capacitance is most a problem at high frequency, right? Uh, Kurt Zilm has described probes and balanced probes, the push-pull, push-pull, the two sides ground in the center, uh, where he tries to reduce that effect and um, um, has written about this. I believe those were in JMR. Um, so I guess that's the biggest issue. 